Welcome back to the news today. This is The Daily Debate. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu apologized yesterday for, to the country's Arab minority. After Election Day comments, he warned that left-wing NGOs were busing Arab Israelis to the polls in droves to vote against him. But the apology has since been rejected by the Arab Israeli leadership, claiming he didn't even meet with the leadership of the Joint Arab List. Was it a sincere apology on the road to mending deep division in Israel? or a political move to ease mounting international criticism after Netanyahu's re-election. With me is Professor of Political Science, Dr. Hani Zubeda. Good evening. Good evening. How are you, Nubit? And Sami Abu Shkade, Secretary General of the Balad Party in Tel Aviv, Jaffa. Good, Good evening. evening. Uh, I know you both have a lot to say. You already started uh, in the commercial break. But before, let's uh, go to Ayman Siksek. We just saw him in the studio. <coughs> a look at uh, some of what our viewers had to say. Ayman, good evening. Good evening, Nurit, and good evening to our guests. Well, some would say that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has left us all wondering about his stance on a Palestinian state. Having retracted his objection after winning the elections, we wanted to see what our viewers think about his standing today. We asked them, do you believe Netanyahu opposes a Palestinian state? And the results of our poll today show a clear division. As you can see, Nurit, 51% voted yes. They think he does oppose a Palestinian state, but 42% voted no, so a very close call. And this division was also apparent in the comments we have today. And let's start with David. He writes, it's like he said, he is not opposed to it, but it's just impossible right now, given the current political climate. For example, Fatah is in a joint government with Hamas, who is a terrorist organization. And an even more dramatic view came from Anna, who said, everybody should. A Palestinian state now means ISIS inside Israel. The dream of a state is over. They always rejected compromises. Now the time is over. Next up, Dalia looks at the international aspect. She tells us, seems like most of the world is recognizing a Palestinian state. Israel's objection makes it seem like it's deliberately stopping the peace process. What does Netanyahu have to gain, she asks. An important question, for sure. And lastly, we have Shadi, who said Netanyahu has no choice but to support it. His objection was part of his election propaganda. And that's another explanation often used here in Israel, too, to explain the shift in Netanyahu's views. Seems like our viewers today were as conflicted as Netanyahu himself about the issue. But that's all the time we have for comments today, Nurit. Sending it back to you. Thank you, Ayman. So very, uh, anytime it's about Netanyahu and especially uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a lot of uh, sharp opinions. We spoke about, uh, we started with the apology to Arab Israelis, but before that, let's uh, talk about this, the Palestinian state comments. Netanyahu seems to have just uh, thrown out the roadmap that was created many, many years ago. Is anybody believing him that he does want a two-state solution? No, nobody believed him from the beginning. And I don't know any serious man who knows Netanyahu and knows his political views that thought that Netanyahu would bring alone the Palestinian state. Without serious international pressure, Netanyahu will do nothing. It's much easier for him. <coughs> his audience doesn't want to see the state. He himself do not believe in the right of the Palestinians for a state. So in order to do so, there must be some serious international pressure on Netanyahu. I think without this pressure, Netanyahu will never lead them. I think in the next few years, we will see much more pressure on the Israeli government. And this thing, this dream of a Palestinian state, will, will take some time. I think one of the any big mistakes of the Palestinian leadership, that since the Oslo Agreement, they have been promising their people that peace is just a matter of time. In a few weeks, everything mm -hmm. will be solved. I mean, there is no Israeli partner for a serious just peace solution for the Palestinians. We should say this to the Palestinians and to the whole world. It will take time. This is a long process. It's going to take a lot of time. The Israelis will try to do their best to make it as, as far as, as possible. And the international arena also now, with, with all the things happening in the Middle East, will not be also ready to do enough pressure on the Israelis to do the change. What Sami mentions, and a few of our viewers mentioned, this is Israel has no choice, that not only have the international community and, uh, and the Palestinian bids at the UN, but now we have the US saying we might not even support you at the UN. Can Israel afford this kind of isolation? Does Netanyahu, is, he's taking that into account, the kind of isolation that a statement like that will, will drive Israel into, whether he retracts it or not? While uh, my friend Sami is the historian amongst the two of us, let me please put this in a historical perspective. I think Netanyahu 
will have now three terms within his one term. The first term would be the homogenic term because he's going to have a very narrow coalition in which he's going to lead. And he's going to wait patiently for Obama uh, to leave the office and wait for the next American president, thinking that if the Republican wins, he might have a better chance. That all will be restored. Excellent. And you know that as well. Now, that would be the first period. Second period will become when the next president is going to get into the office. He or she, whether it's Hillary Clinton or somebody from the Republican system, when they're going to get in, I think that they understood that there's a shift in the Middle East. And it is extremely important to understand that the most important or salient player in the Middle East are the Arabs and not the Israeli state. This needs so to, they've been betting their money on the wrong on the wrong side all but, this time. But they weren't really betting their money because they were spreading their odds almost evenly on the table while supporting Israel because Israel does hold the fact that it is the only uh, representative democracy in the Middle East, which is has been standing for her for a long time for the state. Now, this would be the end of the honeymoon, and then. There would come the third period Is it in which after Sami. The honeymoon or no, just a sort of I don't period think of mediocrity? So. Here's what I think. I, I do not see, I do not foresee a pressure, international pressure, as was on South Africa. But I do see an immense pressure from the United States. And But however, unlike South Africa, who has a lot of minerals and resources, Israel has zero minerals and zero resources, <laughs> even the small resource some that they have. Some gas and some good exactly, military technology. But it's being held in American hands. It's noble energy. And the United States can put sanction on noble energy, regardless of Israel. I think eventually all funnels down into a very narrow tube which says, I, I do not believe in peace anymore. I don't think we need to talk about peace. We need to talk about historical justice. I think we need historical justice with the Palestinians. Over five decades of occupation must come to an end. Um, and really, I, 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 do, just, I, do want, I do want to take a car with Sami and drive to Beirut. I think we're going to have a lot of fun there. I would there. like to do that. Yeah. Sami, so let's go. Uh, we've had this apology and this backtracking in the well, Palestinian yeah, uh, state issue, talking all of uh, Netanyahu's pre-election statements and, of course, the statement that we mentioned in the opening on Israel's uh, Arab citizens. This apology has been rejected by the joint list. Is this, uh, will it do anything to mend what what he did? Nurit, the whole discussion about the, the, uh, any, the, the racist thing that the, the Netanyahu said and his apology is, is, is being and uh, talking about out of context. And to be honest, first of all, just to think about what happened. The prime minister of the Israeli, of, of Israel, thought that if he's going to say something racist towards the Arab, this will encourage masses of the Jews to go and vote for him. Isn't that exactly and the what problem happened? Here, the problem here is not just what Netanyahu said. The problem here is that the Israeli society is racist enough to react to this racist thing in the way that they are going, instead of punishing Netanyahu for his racism and stop voting for him, they are ready, and the society is racist enough to deal with this as something good and go and support the racist man. This is one thing. What is more dangerous than his say, and saying this during the election is what he said a few years ago. And this is very, very dangerous, that he said that from his point of view, he deals with 20% of the Israeli citizens as strategic threat for the Jewish, for the Jewish state. So and, 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 and then you were not talking about a small neo-Nazi group here or there or a small minority. We are talking about the prime minister who's dealing with 20% of his population as strategic so threat. So he's going to plan for them as a strategic threat. So let's talk about that 20%. We had an incredible thing in this election for the first time, a joint list of Arab parties, a sort of a, a unity that Israel hasn't seen before. Why didn't more go out to vote and sort of counteract those racist statements? First of all, in, in numbers, the Arab-Palestinian minority, now we're talking about like something like 68% of the population has voted. Now, taking into consideration that you have few persons who are living abroad, and then few people who are imprisoned, and then some few people who are very old and can, this is quite high You're percentage it was a good of voting. I, I and 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 for something which is happening for the first time, 
with four different parties that were fighting for years between each other, the percentage of, of voting inside the Arab population, I think, in, in my point of view, was very satisfactory. There's a serious problem here, in my point of view, is why weren't there enough Jewish voters for the joint list? Do you agree? Mm. Well, I have a mixed feeling about it, and I'm going to speak as a political scientist. As a political scientist, I would say something. I wrote a few papers about the Arab population participation in Israeli election. In years, it has been the um, pattern of the Arab voting that local elections, they vote almost 100 percent. National election, they vote under 30 percent. Why? Because in the local elections, these are things that have uh, an immediate and significant impact on their daily lives, regardless of the fact that the interior ministry really blocks them from almost all initiatives, they still have some wiggling room to change their lives. At the national arena, most of the Arabs felt that they cannot really, they're not part of the system, um, they vote yet they have no impact on the system then they'd rather... Did that change in this election? Well, I don't think it changed in that uh, system. I think that what we saw is a spur of hope due to the fact that, as Sami said, four of the Arab lists who were fighting amongst them for years joined forces. There are two ways to look at minority voting. Um, it happened in the United States as well. There is what we call democratic deficit. Democratic deficit happens when under 50 percent of the population show up for the election in general terms. That means that the entire parliament has no legitimacy. In Israel, it almost became that situation when the voting percentile deteriorated into 62 percent. The Arabs have two options, either not to show up at all and say, we do not trust the Israeli country, we do not take part in the elections, we do not want representatives or to go out in droves and numbers, but which is democratically legitimate because they are full citizens of the state. And in this case, I think Sami has a point. There was a mass show up, more than double the numbers they're used to. But I think the Arab leaders expected more people to show up. Well, sure, it's legitimate, but what's legitimate, what's justified is not always right. It's not always the smartest thing to do. If it is legitimate to say, okay, we don't want to exercise our right to vote, because of a perception that the country will never do, that will never undertake the policies needed. It's, it's a sort of a waste of, a waste of your a democracy Nuri, you live Nuri, in. Nuri, Why not make a change from inside? First of all, it's never black or white. Yes. Okay, we are talking about huge societies. Mm -hmm. and now we are talking about more than seven million people living in Israel. And you have all different kinds of political trends and social It's amazing how few people relatively live in Israel with how many Opinions issues. and parties yeah. and, and have, issues, yeah. And it's a very multicultural society. People coming from all over the world that immigrated to Palestine and living here. And the Palestinians themselves, you have a lot of, and there are lots of, of and a lot of things to think about when we are talking about the political situation inside Israel. Now, first of all, the Arab Palestinian population, if they will decide not to vote, this will not mean that the Zionist parties will not come to play again in their, in their playground. This will be more dangerous than leaving the Knesset, okay? Which was happening, by the way, till 1992. The vast majority of the Arab Palestinian minority were voting for those who were suppressing them, oppressing them. So, and this is a very complicated issue if, if to participate or not to participate. Now, but we, we talked about the United States a few times. Dahl said that the most important reason for participating in the elections is the feeling that you can do a change. Now, because of racism inside the Israeli society and the, all the Israeli governments and the exclusion of the Arabs but outside the government, blame. just, just it, a it second may be true, but Just a second word. Because of the exclusion of the president, most of the Palestinian minority asks you when, 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 when you ask them to go and vote, why to go there if I'm not going to be part of the coalition the and do a change. What does the alternative give you? If you say it's not going to help well, the vote, the alternative is a guarantee that it won't help, isn't there it? Are, no, there are two, two main yani, sayings about this. First of all, the Islamic Northern Movement is saying, first yeah. of all, let's tell everybody that this fake of Jewish democracy is just a fake. It's not working. And you have also the Palestinian national trends, which are saying, we are helping to keep this fake going on. Not participating will tell the whole world that Israel is not part of the democratic club anymore. Well, it's an issue. I remember, and you probably remember, the vote or die campaign in the United States. 
the African Americans in the United States came as little as 28% to vote. And the defi Democratic deficit was clear cut. 48% voted in the United States for the general election. That was a terrible disaster. People were afraid because when you get lower than 50%, you lose all legitimacy to the Congress, to the House, to the presidency. And then vote or die. You remember Puff Daddy and so on, and all the celebrities that came out and said, right. you must vote. I think in Israel, the situation varies a bit. But I think Sami has a point, And it's kind of like a dual process. Um, you don't really know what to do, but you are trying to find your way out in any case. Fortunately, that's all the time we have. Sami yes. Abu Shkade, Dr. Hani Zubeda, thank you very much for this. Thank I don't you, think uh, the issues will be revol resolved anytime soon, so we'll be back to explain it further. We're out for two minutes, and we'll be back with one-on-one. -on -one. Don't go anywhere.